I see almost everyone is back. So uh, let's start again. Um, so the afternoon session. Uh, we start with actively supporting data management, learning from the approach of three research institutions. So we have heard this morning uh, what is expected of us or one of the things, or some things that are expected of us repository managers, librarians, um, or how uh, open access officer, um, what we are dealing with. And uh, first we'll have Robin Rice, uh, from, uh, who is a data librarian at Edinburgh University Data Library. And she will be talking on developing online data management resources for researchers and librarians. So as said, um, she is a data librarian at the University of Edinburgh, based at Edina and Data Library, a division of uh, information services. She's the service manager of both the university's data library and the institutional data repository. Uh, Edinburgh Data Share, and she sh serves on I the no, Edina management no. team and the IS uh, Research Data Management Implementation Committee. Uh, she has led a number of JISC um, funded projects aimed at building capacity for data curation and research data management services uh, at the University of Edinburgh. So I would say that we have an excellent speaker here to uh, tell us something about supporting, actively supporting data management. Uh, I s is it working out? Uh, we have to wait a little bit more for technical reasons. And then we can start. Is there? Yeah, yeah. okay. Do you like this? Um, for switching sure. The yeah, that might help. Um, I didn't try it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Just getting used to all this equipment. Um, yeah, so I'm the data librarian at University of Edinburgh, which I'll say a little bit more as, as part of the topic. Um, I'm in a unit called Edina and Data Library, which is a division of information services. Um, you may or may not be familiar with Edina, which is a JISC-funded national data center providing online services for UK higher and further education. Um, I'm just going to explain about data libraries a little bit, and our data library in particular, as uh, a lead into the topic of data management support and training for librarians. Um, so these are my main topics. A little bit of background about what we're doing at University of Edinburgh and um, something called our Research Data Management Roadmap, which is uh, a, a way that we're categorizing um, things we need to do to really implement our data policy and, and then what we're doing in terms of training and particularly for librarians with the DIY RDM training kit. Um, so data libraries have actually been around for a while. The term might mean, it might m bring different things to mind like a software library of um, programs or um, it, it basically comes out of uh, the social science tradition of reusing data, especially large-scale survey data or census data that's maybe collected by government um, or a large research project and has a lot of information in it that can be mined over and over again by a lot of different people. And then social, especially quantitative social scientists um, wouldn't have had to go out and collect their own entire national sample survey uh, to do their analysis. So that's a strong tradition in the social sciences for secondary analysis. Um, and some of the earliest data libraries, in, especially in North America, where it's more of a tradition, and Europe, where we have national data archives being a little bit more of a tradition, it goes right back to when things like census data were digitized in the 1940s. Um, as soon as there was digitized data, there was a need for these data libraries. So. Th this is what Wikipedia says, and it's always a focus on the reuse of data in, for secondary analysis. 
so our data library service at Edinburgh has been around since 1983, and th the reason for that is the first um, population census data that became available in digital form for analysis was the 1981 census. So when the government was going to, whoops, was, uh, that might be on an animation slide by mistake. Um, the, the library wasn't really ready at that time to deal with digital forms of data, so the data library was created and we were actually part of the computing service for many years. But now information services are all merged anyway, one big happy family between IT and librarians. But the data library has remained intact in all this time. So our emphasis traditionally in the data library was always helping staff and students um, in finding, accessing, using, and teaching with the finding teaching data sets or turning their research data into um, teaching data sets. For example, this very pretty um, data visualization at the bottom, or no, at the top, <laughs> sorry, the map, is mobile phone usage. Um, you know, so it, it may be something like that. Um, so this is just a screenshot of our website of the, the data library service itself. And now that comes inside of a bigger web page about all kinds of research data support. But this is where our sort of bread and butter service um, resides and the finding data is a data catalog, which in the past would have been a catalog of data sets we had like on nine track tape or had locally. And it's become more and more of a virtual catalog of pointers on the internet. But um, of course with Google, there's much less need for that kind of um, virtual catalog. So we're, we're finding other things to do as will become apparent uh, as we go on but things like accessing data through national online services or perhaps purchasing an expensive data set, um, they could come to us. In some cases, it's uh, like with uh, Eurostat, European Labor Force Survey, where the data manager who keeps it under lock and key um, de-encrypts the files for the user and you know all of that kind of thing. Or we might help with people using data either with statistical packages or GIS mapping packages um, to a certain extent. We're not statisticians ourselves. And I just wanted to say, I know this is a pre-conference to ELAG, but there is another conference um, just three hours away by train in Cologne this week for iAssist. And it only comes around to Europe every few years because it's international cycle. And um, there will be a lot of data librarians there, but also data archivists and other data professionals, some social scientists. Um, and this is, you get to meet Superman apparently outside of the Cologne Cathedral. That's from their website, it's very entertaining. So I'm sure the hashtag will be entertaining too. You can be attending one conference and watching another one, um, as I'll probably try to do too. Uh, so on to the policy. Um, this was apparently uh, one of the first, or maybe the first formal uh, policy in the UK on research data management specifically. Um, we, there were a lot of things leading up to that, but I won't go into ancient history on you. Uh, basically, it passed the University Senate in May 2011, and um, because it's, it's quite nicely written, I can say that because I didn't write it, but uh, Chris Rusbridge, the previous uh, former director of the Digital Curation Center, drafted it um, at the request of our librarian. And we came up with 10 brief principles. So it's, it is quite readable, but not quite so brief for a PowerPoint. Um, and uh, it sets a lot of what it's doing is setting out the roles and responsibilities, what's expected of the researcher, what's expected of the university, and sort of what the boundary is, because um, we we wanted to emphasize those responsibilities without um, interfering, without being seen to interfere in the researchers' control of their own data. So I th think we got that balance pretty well because other universities have been sort of copying what we set out. Um, and I just wanted to underline that th that didn't happen by magic. There was a wide consultation. There was a committee that you know, talked really hard about what should be in it and then we consulted widely across all the colleges and schools, got feedback, revised it before it was passed. 
Um, so that's my picture of the policy. It doesn't really tell you that much, but Wordles are fun to put in PowerPoint slides. Um, I think it's, a s it's the language is softer than some of the other policies I've seen that is really focusing on a mandate. But at the time, all because um, we were a bit cautious being the first university in the UK to say we're going to have this policy, we really wanted to back up what the research funders were saying was needed. And that actually is, um, did seem to be the right tack to take. And I th I'm not sure why the word appropriate is so big. I've controlled for the words research and data, otherwise that would be the biggest words. But I think it's about depositing as appropriate in an appropriate repository. Um, so on to the roadmap, how we're gonna implement this wonderful policy because, you know, let's face it, it's just words until, um, until a lot of people start doing a lot of things. <laughs> um, this is the picture of, of the roadmap, which is a high level strategic plan um, for, we've, we've only kind of set out what we're gonna do over an 18 month period and then, but the, but the goals and objectives take us beyond that and we can come up with some more deliverables after we see how far we get after 18 months. Um, so the data management planning, we're getting a lot of help with that s set of work packages from the Digital Curation Center. Uh, we're, we're looking at using their DMP online tool and customizing it for University of Edinburgh use. So we give them some of the answers based on the services we can provide um, we also think it needs some customization right down to the research unit level because, you know, let's face it, all research, as we heard from um, colleagues at the table, all research looks different. And so you need to use the appropriate language for that research discipline. Um, active data infrastructure, my colleagues in the IT department are working on rolling out um, a, a petabyte or a couple of petabytes of storage so, so that to suit the majority of needs of all the researchers. We, we, kn we know going right back to a 2007 research, research computing survey that what the researchers really want from us is storage space. So before we get too far in rolling out all of the other shoulds and shouldn'ts and best practice, we wanna make sure we have that storage in place so that they can have a place of secured, networked, backed up place to work on their data and collaborate with anyone that they were collaborating with around the world. The data stewardship is a lot of what I'm focusing on in terms of our data repository, thinking about the digital preservation requirements, 10 years and more, and also uh, working across systems because we have a, we use Pure for a, um, a current research information system uh, to keep track of research projects and we want all the systems to kind of make sense and work together and not cause the researcher to have to put in metadata multiple times. So there's a lot of interoperability in that work package. But what I'll talk about a little bit more is actually the data management support, um, which all of, so as you see the whole roadmap it takes rec um, involvement from colleagues right across IS. It's been um, quite fun that way to get out of my silo and other people get out of theirs to work together. Um, so what I mean by data management support is general consultancy and support service throughout the research process. Um, this is, I, I put this in at the last minute because everybody's been showing data life cycles and I thought, oh, I have another good one. So uh, unless you're sick of data life cycles, um, and, and let's face it, not everybody likes these data life cycles. I've come across several researchers, including the head of our steering group, who just goes, I don't get it, you know, leave that thing out. But we tend to like it. Um, so in the beginning, where the researcher has the clever idea and is designing their study, that's when they really should be doing their data management planning. That, that might come as a surprise to them but um, that would be the time to start thinking about it. Then of course, through all the research project itself, you have to provide some kind of infrastructure for them, like I was talking about with the storage. And then at the end, maybe you could think of it as a life course, if not a life cycle. Uh, 
how, how are they going to pass on that data for someone else to curate? It's a, some may choose to do that themselves, but the majority would want to pass that on and publish it in a repository of some sort and then move on to the next research project. Uh, so I've borrowed this slide from Monash University, who will come up again. And uh, right, so so this is in one slide everything that we th think comes under data management support and the roadmap. Um, so we need guidance for academic staff, and at, at the moment we're doing that through our web page, web pages. Um, we we need to be training people right from the beginning to establish better practice as people learn their research skills. So we're, um, we've worked with three, um, three schools about embedding this online training course in their, um, in their programs and we're slowly getting out to others. It's, I'll tell you more about Mantra in a minute. Um, we're doing awareness raising. Well, we haven't actually really started, but as soon as we know the storage is in place in a couple more months, We'll get, there will be a schedule of awareness raising and service rollout to talk about, um, you know, carrot and stick almost. Like, you're getting this storage. How are you going to use it? What procedures are you going to set up at the school level to allocate your space and manage things properly? And then the really tricky stuff, what about in-depth data management consultancy, maybe getting s and the idea of embedded librarians working on uh, grants costed in the grants. Um, and we've got one pilot example of that with a research project called Acumen Advanced Quantitative Methods Network, which is a social science uh, research project um, or set of projects really uh, in Scotland and with um, speakers elsewhere. And I'm, I'm costed in for six days a year over four years to be a quality assurance advisor on their data management planning. So that'll be interesting to see how that works. And then we also need to train librarians and IT staff, of course, to, uh, to raise their game. So this is what the online guidance looks like. Everybody's doing it now. Um, we've had that in place since 2009, but we recently revised it. Um, I'm not really sure how much I mean, I, I have Google Analytics and things, but we need to find out more about what, whether it's meeting the researchers' needs. One thing that isn't in there that we know is costing, which is a tricky one, um, which we'll work on in the roadmap. And then there's Mantra, which came out of a JISC-funded project, but we're maintaining it and updating it. Um, we think it's quite useful. This shows you that this is the only place I'll talk about what the names of the units are. There's about eight units with it's a self-paced course you can go to the website anybody can go to the website and work through it at their own pace i've been told by a couple of people doing the whole thing takes about three hours um, but that doesn't count the recommended reading which can give you a lot more if you want to and uh, it's it uses an online tool called xerti for um, which is a a learning software creation tool at the moment, it doesn't show up in the iPlayer because it's based on, uh, uh, sorry, it doesn't show up on the iPad because it's based on Flash, but we're, we're, we're gonna migrate, there's a new version that uses HTML5, so we're gonna migrate it over to that. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in there uh, that seems to be quite effective. This is, again, another Wordle just taking a peek at what shows up in one unit about documentation and metadata. Maybe should have controlled those words. Um, so what about the liaison librarian training? Um, we've done a pilot with, with four uh, liaison librarians and um, over, over the winter, and now we're going to train another four because that seemed to go pretty well. Uh, so that's a collaboration between the data library and our u user services division where the librarians are based. It's, it's based on Mantra. Um, it really was inspired by uh, data intelligence for librarians, which you'll hear more about in the next talk. And again, Mon oops, again Monash. This is Sam Searle, who was at Monash, and she's moved on. But um, she won an, an award for uh, uh, 
doing data management in in an Australian li uh, university library, and she used her grant money to come to the UK and visit with us and Oxford and other places, and we had her give a talk about what it was like, what their program with liaison librarians was, and this is what they had accomplished up to 2009, so they really were a, an early trendsetter. And what I really got from her, and I keep remembering as I'm doing this training, is that it's all about building up the confidence of the librarians to go out there and talk to the researchers about data. Um, so I didn't, I, I realized I should have had a picture of our first four trainees, and I didn't, so I found this on the internet. So the idea here is we've trained our librarians, and we love librarians, so we've put out this training kit so other librarians who want to use our method can go and set up their own small groups and train themselves. So it's the training kit. Um, so I'll just tell you how we did it, and this is all part of the kit as well. Um, and the approach really is that the librarians are professionals. They've got their own experience to bring to these issues. It's not so much about right and wrong answers. It's about getting people talking, sharing stories in a small, comfortable, private space. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think it's important to talk to them about how they want to do their training, get, get their agreement about how we proceed, not just get the permission from the managers to train them. Um, yeah, so emphasis on facilitation rather than teaching, which is why anyone can do it. You don't need to have an expert um, if you have a good facilitator. These are the topics. It's a bit of a, sometimes it's a putting two mantra units together or skipping one. Um, these are the topics that we agreed were important. And um, we, had, we had guest speakers with a short talk to remind people about what the topic of that week was about, followed by long discussions. Um, it was a two hour duration. People were talking through the whole, the whole time. So either we got a very talkative first group or it worked very well. And we also used group exercises from UK Data Archive, which are excellent such as looking at different kinds of consent forms and saying, now, is this enough to, to go ahead and publish that data, or should that consent form be changed? So it really gets people thinking. And then we also gave them homework. So, but we gave them plenty of time to do it, at least two weeks in between each session, because they had to fit this into their regular job. Um, and the main thing was they do go through the mantra unit and the recommended reading. And then they have reflective questions, which they either can write in advance or just be prepared to talk about in the group. It kind of puts them in the shoes of a researcher. And then uh, right now, the, f the first four librarians are going to interview a researcher and write up a data curation profile to build up their confidence, actually taking the, what they've learned into the real world with, with researchers. And we also want to practice what we preach and put the data curation profile up there on the Purdue website where they're trying to collect a bunch of discipline-specific data curation profiles. Um, so that's all the contents of the training kit, everything you need to do what we did, um, available on a website in zip files. And if you don't have your own local speakers for the short talks or you don't have all of them, you can use our podcasts or you can use the PowerPoints and and each, uh, you can use the participants could present each, each week's um, session by studying it in advance. And of course, in any training you should evaluate in some way, so we have an evaluation form to find out how it went. And it's all Creative Commons licensed, so you, you can do whatever you want with it. You can change it and uh, make it your own. And those are some of the links, thank you.